Day 935 of this Trump administration, two years to the day since the Nazi march on Charlottesville that led to a spasm of violence and the taking of an innocent life. It also gave us something of a benchmark moment in the Trump presidency when the president characterized it this way. You had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Two years later now, Donald Trump's presidency has been wrapped in the label of racism and white supremacy, indeed right now broiled along those same lines. Phil Rucker of The Washington Post, who joins us in just a moment, reminds us that in the past month, Trump, quote, used racist remarks to attack four congresswomen of color, maligned a majority black Baltimore district as a rat and rodent infested mess, and saw his anti-immigrant rhetoric parroted in a statement that authorities believe was written by a mass shooter. The piece goes on to say Trump feels the charges of racism are just another attempt to discredit him, not unlike he believes the more than a dozen women who have accused him of sexual misconduct or the investigation into Russian election interference. Trump said as much just before leaving the White House last Friday. For them to throw out the race word again, racist, 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 that's all they use to anybody. They call anybody a racist when they run out of cards. I'm winning in the polls. They're desperate. The New York Post is reporting that shortly after that, at a fundraiser in the Hamptons, Trump, quote, made fun of U.S. allies, South Korea, Japan, mimicking Japanese and Korean accents. Not the first time for him. Negotiating with, with Japan, negotiating with China. When these people walk in the room, they don't say, Oh, hello. How's the weather? It's so beautiful outside. Isn't it lovely? How are the Yankees doing? Oh, they're doing wonderful. Great. They say, we want deal. Earlier on this network, former Republican congressman and one-time governor of South Carolina, Mark Sanford, summed Trump up this way. I don't think he's, you know, a white nationalist, but I think that the white nationalists think that he's a white nationalist, and that's even more troubling. I mean, you don't want somebody who thinks that they're speaking to... To, to, to you if you're in that particular uh, line of thinking. So I, I, I think that the issue okay. is, rightly or wrongly, they're reading the tea leaves in a way that's sympathetic to them, and that's a real problem. This weekend, following a particularly difficult period in our country, Trump was on social media pushing a conspiracy theory that the Clintons somehow had Jeffrey Epstein killed in jail. It was quickly picked up and promoted by Russian state media. Annie Carney, who's also standing by to talk with us, and Maggie Haberman of The New York Times spoke to conservative writer and National Review editor Rich Lowry about this. He told them, quote, it's another example of something where he should stop and think about the fact that he's president of the United States and stop his thumbs, but he never does. In addition to the conspiracy theories, there were the attacks against the fake news media, China, other nations that are, quote, ripping off the U.S., Joe Biden, even a short-lived communications director, Anthony Scaramucci, after the mooch appeared on Bill Maher, which the president apparently accidentally watched on Friday night, Scaramucci just recently started calling the president's rhetoric racially charged and divisive to the country, and he says he's calling on Republicans to look elsewhere in 2020. Hey, guys, we got to wake up now. Because we're in a dangerous situation. The yellow light is on. It's going to go red. If he wins the next presidential election, look out. On that note, here for our leadoff discussion on a Monday night, Annie Carney, White House reporter with The New York Times, Phil Rucker, Pulitzer Prize winning White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, and Michelle Bernard, a lawyer, journalist, president of the Bernard Center for Women, Politics and Public Policy. Good evening and welcome to you all. Annie, there is something about a conspiracy theory. Uh, sometimes it's birtherism. Sometimes it's the Clintons killed Epstein in jail that gets into this president's head. He has long stoked conspiracy theories, again, from birtherism to this idea that there's a deep state and a secret hidden hand at work that is trying to un, uh, take away his his win or, or delegitimize him. And this, uh, we wrote in this piece today that there is a special subcategory of his constant conspiracy theories that is accusing his political opponents of murder. You'll remember that during the 2016 Republican primary, he um, 
pushed forward a baseless accusation that Senator Ted Cruz's father was involved with the murder of JFK. Mm -hmm. um, he has dabbled in the idea that the Clintons were involved in Vince Foster's murder. Uh, and then we, we saw him retweet around Epstein's murder this idea that maybe the Clintons were connected to it. The Clintons are this forever foil for him. He has a wide group of Democrats to choose from right now, but none of them seem to have the same um, guttural sense of, of attacking the Clintons, who have been part of a right wing. One thing that Hillary Clinton said rightly, they've been part of a right wing conspiracy theorizing for a very long time. Um, but this is part of how he muddies the waters about truth, presents a separate set of facts. It's unclear whether he believes the conspiracy theories that he puts out there. But what he knows is that some people latch onto it and that works for him as a tactic. Phil, our other topic here at the top of the broadcast is race and how does one, yeah. especially if one is, say, White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, how does one square the president's pushback? No one likes having that label applied to them. Uh, how does one square that with the language and the behavior that got us here? Well, Brian, you, you square that by telling the truth, which is that some of the president's words and actions going back decades now are plainly racist. Uh, he is not changing his behavior, and, and that's why the label still applies to him. The difference now, uh, compared to all of these other moments where he has done things uh, that have led people to call him racist, is that it threatens to become defining for him heading into the next campaign. He, for the last month now, uh, has been... Uh, on the attack on these racial issues. He sent those racist tweets about the four congresswomen of color. He attacked Baltimore for several days, as well as its congressman, longtime congressman Elijah Cummings, who is African-American. And, and then we see the rhetoric and its handling of the, uh, of the shooting in El Paso. This is part of a strategy, by the way, uh, that the president has for his reelection, where he wants to use cultural divisions. He wants to use race. Uh, to divide the country and to mobilize, to galvanize his white supporters uh, to rally behind his banner for re-election in November of 2020. And it's probably going to continue. And I assume we're going to see the Democrats uh, continue to label him a, a racist in the presidency. Michelle, as I uh, welcome you to the broadcast, I have this for you from Jennifer Rubin on Trump conspiracy theories. This is from The Wall Street Journal. There is a simple formula for responding to these episodes. One, reaffirm that they're baseless, crazy theories. Two, remind Americans that as President Trump has access to the very best intelligence, but instead prefers to spread dark, false conspiracy theories. Three, Trump's microphone is the loudest in the world, and whether he intends to, his words will stir some unstable and or evil people to act. And four, in putting Americans at risk, he violates his oath, and if he believes in what he's saying, he is also mentally unfit to lead. Uh, that was The Washington Post. Forgive me, uh, my error. Uh, uh, that's saying a lot. And, Michelle, the question to you is, what's a patriotic American to do? A, a, a patriotic American has to absolutely call it out and call out every single instance of racism that we see at the behest of the president, at the behest of these keyboard terrorists, Nazis, um, and white supremacists who follow the lead of his language. Ever since this president has been in office, black and brown people are quaking. It leads one to believe that Lady, Lady Liberty would be weeping if she could, and, and some to ask whether Martin Luther King and Heather Heyer, who died in Charlottesville, whether they died in vain. Some of the actions that we've seen since, since Charlottesville uh, since Charlottesville, because of the president's um, language, uh, have given rise to, for example, um, people that we have uh, we will see referred to as golf cart, um, as golf cart Carolina and uh, permit Patty uh, and Cornerstone Caroline, people who've called um, called the police, for example, on African Americans for things that are really trivial. Black men uh, having a barbecue in um, Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. A young African American, I. I I think she was eight years old, little girl selling bot bottled water without a permit. Another woman, much like uh, occurred with Emmett Till, accused a little African-American boy of groping her in a grocery store, and all of the videotape footage absolutely demonstrated that his backpack nicked her. He in no way groped her. We are going back you know, we, a few years ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Brown versus uh, Board of Education, as well as so much civil rights legislation. This administration has taken us back 
50 or 60 years. We, we continue to see that black men are two times more likely to be killed at the hands of police for, than white men. We saw um, two white men in the last few weeks. One went to a, a Walmart in, I believe, in Florida, another one in Missouri. One mentioned, you know, three more days till my probation is up and then I'm going to get my AR-15. Don't go to Walmart next week. Another man goes into Walmart covered, uh, you know, with a gun, um, ammunition, I think 100 uh, rounds of ammunition. He's in a, uh, you know, bulletproof vest. Both of them are arrested in Walmart, where, whereas just a few years ago, a young man goes into a Walmart in Beaver Creek, Ohio, a young African-American man. He is shopping for a um, BB gun. The, uh, a white male calls the police on him, and he is killed. He is gunned down. All of this, I believe, is a, is a result of the president's rhetoric, and he has to be called out on it every single day because lives are at stake. You can't go to church and be safe. You cannot go to a synagogue and be safe. You cannot go to a movie and be safe. You can't shop at Walmart for school supplies and be safe. The administration separates children from their families. Um, the administration arrests uh, undocumented workers at factories, but does not do anything whatsoever to the people who hire them illegally. There is an attack on black and brown people in this country. And, and the simple thing that for the patriot to do is to vote and to call it out every time we see it. And Annie Carney, into all of this, into this atmosphere flies a story out of nowhere that one Jeffrey Epstein has died in his federal prison cell here in New York. It's a sad, tragic story, of course, for all the victims. It's an interesting story because of all the entanglements. What is the level of interest, level of worry that you've been able to ascertain from the Trump White House? Well, his campaign aides were worried about the past friendship starting during in 2015 mm -hmm. when he was thinking about launching a presidential campaign. And he, they were, you know, the Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein have seen on footage that NBC yep. got were filmed partying and ogling women together at Mar-a-Lago in the 1990s. Um, they were friends through the 90s and the early aughts. Um, I, they had a falling out. The reasons are unclear. Haven't spoken in over a decade. Um, Donald Trump has been very clear in wanting to highlight the breakup more than the previous friendship. But he always felt insulated and saw it more as a potential weapon to use against the Clintons because Epstein also had a, relation, a relationship with President Bill Clinton. So here in the tweet he sent, um, one, I talked to a historian, Douglas Brinkley, today, who said that what he's trying to do here is get ahead of the game and say his connection is to Bill Clinton, not to, not to, to the Donald. Um, so that's what he's doing here. He's aware that there's questions about what their relationship was. But I don't sense a lot of fear among his aides about um, a direct connection between the Trump administration and mm -hmm. the strangeness of the, of the suicide. Um, and we saw Rudy Giuliani, Mr. Trump's personal lawyer, go out and kind of try and walk him back from spouting these conspiracy theories today, saying, let's wait for the facts to settle. It is the Justice Department that Trump oversees that has to figure this out and to figure out what went wrong. So I think we, that I interpreted as kind of trying to let the Justice Department have space to do their job here without the president's interference. Phil Rucker, uh, we note the weather forecast for tomorrow, uh, which is a chance of showers beginning at midday in uh, uh, New Jersey, uh, yeah. with uh, some violent weather perhaps moving in late in the day. We note that because that often means no golf, that means interior time, that means television, that means Twitter. Are there, and I, we've asked you this before, are there moderating factors, people around the president, are they on this trip? Are they in his life? <laughs> Brian, there are always people around the president who wish they could be moderating influences, who try to be moderating, moderating influences. But the reality is Trump uh, is going to say and, and do and tweet what he wants to do. And we've seen it time and again where, you know, John Kelly, the four star general, the disciplinarian, was not able to moderate Trump. Ivanka and Jared, who bill themselves as calming influences on the president, I believe they're in New Jersey with him right now, but they, uh, too, are not able to moderate the president. I think he's up there, at least he, he was initially over the weekend, with his new press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, uh, who, you know, is close to the president, close to the first lady. 
uh, but I, it's doubtful that she'll be able to moderate him. And I think the reality is if he sees something on television tomorrow that gets him angry, that stokes one of these grievances that he has, we're all going to hear about it when our phone buzzes in the tweet lands. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.